Luck Church of Christ. Thank you all who've decided to come worship with us today. We're very happy to have you here, especially any visitors we have. And uh, we're going to start with God's Family. will be our first song. John will be happy to hear I left my phone at home today, so it won't be interrupting his, his sermon. Yeah, I know that elephant, I can't control it. It just goes off whenever. It's for work, but yeah, I, I should mute my phone by now. I should know better. But leaving it at home is a good choice, too. So I'll let that be a reminder now. If you have a loud phone like me, you can mute your phone. We're part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. Now we're part of the family that's on its way home. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven. God's family. When a brother meets sorrow, we all feel his grief. When he's passed through the valley, we all feel relief. Together in sunshine, together in rain, together in victory, through his precious name. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven. God's family. Go ahead and skip to the next song, Talon. This song will prepare a mind for the prayer. Uh, so let's be standing for this and the prayer to follow, led by Brother Jim Cole. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. 
So shall I be safe from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. Good morning. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you this time, thanking thee for the time that we could have to be out and to be able to be able to be in, be in this worship service. We pray that you will be with everyone that is here today and that they will give, have blessings from being here. Those also that are out in the fellowship hall, we pray that you would be over them too. We thank you for the granting us this time that we can have in the, the, uh, with the COVID situation and everything going on that we're able to meet and worship and be together as, as best we can. We thank you for the many blessings God's granted us. We pray for the sick that are unable to be here today, that we know there's many on our prayer list that, that are unable to be here, and we, we want to be with them also as, as much as we can. We pray that now that we, we go through this service, you'll be with John as he brings us forth another lesson in this battle that we're fighting each, each day. Go with us now and be with us always. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our next hymn today will be Because He Lives. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, and empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still, the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day, I'll 
across that river, I'll fight life's fire, no war with pain, and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he lives because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know And life is worth the living just because he lives. Let's be standing for this song. This song will be right before the sermon. I'll live in glory. I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high I'll live with him forever in glory by and by Oh yes, I'll live in glory by and by I'll tell and sing love's story there on high, there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I want to be of service along this pilgrim way and lead the lost to Jesus as fervently I pray. As day by day I travel, I'll keep him ever nigh and live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love's story there on high, there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. The end I know is nearing, by faith I look away to yonder home supernal, the land of endless day. I'll cling to him forever and look beyond the sky and live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love's story there on high, there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. Please be seated. Mm, that singing sounded good. Y'all are in the mood to worship, aren't you? Are we all celebrating the decision made by the Supreme Court that we can do this without any restrictions except for size? Listen, we're at 25%, okay? We're in full compliance, which is fantastic. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the comments that I've heard from so many of you that, that you know, Assembled, gathered worship is so much more important than maybe we thought a year ago. I love it. It's true, too. Romans chapter 8, if you have your Bibles, we're in part 10 of the battle. Appreciate Jim's prayer about this series. Before we get into Romans 8, 14 and following, I just want to take a little history tour, if you will. Go back 100 years in your mind. 
Go back 100 years. That was a dark time in America, 1921. The Industrial Revolution had exploded. People were moving from the country into the cities, and they were having uh, good-paying jobs. Young people with good-paying jobs, what are they going to do with their time off? Well, they didn't go to church. They bought booze, and they went wild. It was called the Roaring Twenties for a reason. And so it got so bad. Alcoholism, alcohol psychosis, infant mortality became so bad that the United States Congress enacted the uh, 18th Amendment, the National Prohibition Act, that it was against the law to make and distribute alcohol in the United States. That's how bad it got. Well, what finally killed the party? The Depression. The economy was wrecked by careless men in Wall Street and Washington, D.C., and Americans ended up enslaved to poverty like no other, hardship like no other. Some of you were actually alive during that time. Some of you were children during that time, and you remember how awful it was. And guess what people started doing during the Depression? They went back to church. That's exactly right. The hardship of life, the conviction that they had left God and His commandments and were suffering the consequences, people went back to church. Then the nation was thrust into a state of war, foreign aggressors attacked us, and we were drawn into the deadliest war in human history. But after the Second World War ended, our nation healed, we populated, we built, we prospered, we bought, and we had babies. Oh, my word, we had babies. We had lots of babies. How many here are a baby boomer? That's a pretty good amount. I are one myself. And guess what? During those 50s and 60s, guess what Americans were doing? Not only was it the highest per capita church attendance rate, but Bible sales were out of the roof. Unbelievable amounts of Bibles were being sold during that period. People were going to church. People were taking their kids in the station wagon to church all dressed up and everybody had a Bible and people were reading their Bibles a lot Americans were reading scripture people you worked with were reading their Bibles remember and the reason for that was because we had gone through war we wanted God's blessings but communism was an actual real and present threat in our world and two gigantic nations, China and Russia, had gone atheistic. They'd gone communist, and they were threatening. And so we were Christian. We are a Christian nation. We're, a, we're people of God, and we went to church, and we bought Bibles. Those baby boomers I mentioned a little bit earlier grew up. They weren't at all happy with the status quo. They felt like the United States needed to change, and so they did change the United States. They changed the social and political landscape dramatically. In the 1970s, if you were there, the moral compass of America went from the book of God <laughs> to, oh my word, the sexual revolution and, and you know, Drugs and unbelievable stuff. The 80s and the 90s, the boomers changed. They had, it became the power group, and they began to change things. And guess what else? They changed their churches. They changed their churches from being learning centers to worship centers. The baby boomers wanted to worship. They wanted to express and feel and participate in that part. But 
that sitting down and looking at the word and doctrine, that word doctrine became a negative word during that time in America's church. And so they changed the church. And their children, the baby boomers' children, being raised by that became much more interested in worship and music than in book, chapter, and verse. And now the grandchildren of these baby boomers are leaving the church in droves. Their biblical literacy is tragically low. They don't know the basic stories or tenets of Scripture when interviewed or, or surveyed. They are unaware of the parables of Christ or the common stories of Christ. Their worldview has been shaped by secular education and carnal media far more than the Word of God because they haven't gone to church. Their morality values a lack of spiritual and scriptural theology. And not only has the millennials left the church in droves, but now a large segment of that generation is actually antagonistic against biblical Christianity. I never cease to be amazed at how the parallels between our time and our world are found in the biblical history of God's Word. The more things change, the more they stay the same. There's nothing new under the sun. Didn't Solomon write that? I never cease to be amazed at the parallels. And right now, as I look out over the landscape of our nation, I can't help but think about a period of time in the Word of God where the Jews were, they, they were freed from slavery in Egypt, and they were in the wilderness period for 40 years. I guess that would be a dust bowl now, wouldn't it? And after crossing the Jordan, they battled and possessed the, the land that God had promised them. And after possessing the land, they enjoyed the prosperity after that war. Does that sound familiar? They had that prosperity after that war, and now they're building their estates and their vineyards and their flocks and their trades, and they're very, very busy in their new possessions. And in the book of Judges, we see the generation after people have come into the land of Canaan and possessed the land, and we see in the book of Judges... The very the generation that followed Joshua's generation. We see them suffering. They're suffering from uh, uh, poverty, tremendous, unbelievable civil unrest in the book of Judges. What happened? Why did that happen back then? Well, it tells us right straight up in the beginning of Judges, chapter 2, in verse 10. And all that generation also gathered to their fathers. Who was that? Joshua and his generation before. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So Joshua's generation is dying off, and, they, and that generation neglected to teach their children the law like they were supposed to, Deuteronomy 6. And because they were so busy building their estates and building their homes and building, building, building and prospering, 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 they forgot to do the very thing that they needed to do in the sight of God, which is to teach their children to worship God and obey his commandments. And this says that their generation did not know the Lord. Listen to verse 11. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord and the God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from, other go from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. Verse 13 they abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, so the Lord, was, his anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the hand of the surrendering enemies so they could no longer withstand their enemies. What's all that mean? It means instead of having spiritual fervor, they sank into apathy. And instead of obeying the Lord, they moved to apostasy. And instead of enjoying law and order, 
they filled the nation of Israel with anarchy. Does that sound familiar? It does, doesn't it? I mean, if you've been watching the news in the last year, doesn't that sound a little bit familiar to you? Listen how the book of Judges ends. This is the very last verse in that book. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They did what was right in their own eyes. Now, let me ask you, does that sound familiar? Hey, I'm okay. You're okay. You can't judge me for what I believe, and I won't judge you for what you believe. Hey, I don't think God cares about me sleeping with somebody because I'm not married. God doesn't care that I have a, a wedding license. He doesn't care if I, as long as I'm faithful to that one person. They can even be my own gender. God doesn't care. God doesn't care. God doesn't care. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Because when you stop looking at Scripture, then all you have is opinion, human philosophy, and, 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 and opinion. And so everybody's going to take, and like, well, I don't think, and it's okay. And so it's amazing how, how accurate this verse is, that they did what was right in their own eyes. Certainly, certainly applicable to the most youngest generation in America now, Unfortunately, it looks like the baby boomers failed to teach their children how to be faithful to God. Because you can worship God day and night, but if your morality doesn't match the Bible, then what? Tell me, folks, tell me what. I mean, you can sit in church and praise the Lord, but if your private life is filled with immorality, you tell me, are you following the Lord or not? Tell me. You're not. God is not impressed with a bunch of worshipers. He's impressed with people who do what's right and worship. There's a big difference, isn't it? So it's time for us to reinsert the powerful teachings of God's Holy Scripture into our thinking. It's time for us to reinsert biblical truth into the dialogue of America, into the church. It's time. It's time for us. to learn how to put the misdeeds of the body to death. And that's the reason why we're in Romans 6, 7, and 8. And that's the reason why we're in Romans 8 today. Look at Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will what? You'll live. It's time for us to allow the Holy Spirit to use His Word to help put that sin to death in our life, to keep it that way, amen? It's time for us to remind our children that what God says matters more than what the news says, Facebook says, your friend in school says, your professor who doesn't believe in God says. It's time for us to help our young people to anchor their lives on the Word of God so they don't commit the same sin that they did way back in the book of Judges. That's why I'm going such detail into Romans. Because I believe the best thing that we can do is to remind ourselves of what God says more than what everybody else thinks. Amen! You can't tell I'm getting fed up with human opinion, can you? Do you know that there are some channels on TV that for 24 hours a day, for seven days a week, they have talking heads in there saying what they think is smart. Did you know that? You do know that. You're all going, yeah, I know. Boy, don't hear a lot of those people like going, hey, now that you've got your attention here on the screen and all, would you, would you turn the TV off and pick up your Bible? No. And tragically, the people that they bring on who are experts in Christianity and theology, you're laughing already, huh? Because you've heard those guys, and you're like going, I don't know what Bible that guy's reading. Wow, where did that come from? Woo! They never bring on the conservative, uh, Bible-believing. <laughs> they never bring those guys on. There's always some guy with multiple doctorates and whatever, and it's always on the other side of things. So 
it's time for us to be reminded who we are, and it's time for us to re be reminded this morning of whose we are, and that brings us to Romans 8, 14 through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies uh, uh, or bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So you know what the text says? We are family. That's what it says. We are family. It's good to be reminded. It's good to be reminded. Let me ask you, how do you know that God's your father? Ah, so he said so. Is that your answer? How do you know that God's your father? Because God said so. Listen to this. But to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave right to become children of God. That's John 1, 12. That's pretty good, isn't it? Wait, wait, wait. Listen to this one. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are, exclamation point, in my Bible. The reason the world does not know us is it didn't know him. Beloved, we are now children of God, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Wow, that's good, 1 John chapter 3, 1 and 2, isn't it? But here we got one right here in our very text in front of us, Romans 8, 14. You see it? Didn't it just say we we're all sons of God, children of God? What a powerful affirmation. Verse 16, you know what that says? You're a king's kid. That, that makes you feel pretty good now, don't it? Have you ever thought about that? You're royalty. You're a princess. You're a prince. Now, I wasn't pointing at you, Rod, when I said princess. <laughs> prince. Princess. Have you ever thought about that at all? The Holy Spirit. Not only does the Bible say we're children of God, but the reason why we know we are is because the Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are. One of his first things he does when he comes inside there is, God is your father. You are his child now. What a powerful affirmation. He wants us to be conscious of the fact that we belong to God. We belong to the Lord. We are in his house. Now, it says in verse 15, this phrase, watch it. We did not receive a spirit of slavery, fall back into fear. This next part, watch this. But you have received the spirit of adoption. Now, adoption is not necessarily a, a, a real great word in our culture. Because the, the word adoption carries the idea of a second class. You've got your biological kids, and then you've got your what? Your adopted kids. You've got your biological kids, and then you've got your what? Your stepkids. In our society, the biologicals are the higher realm. But I was fascinated to find out in ancient Rome, that's not the case at all. In ancient Rome, if a man had an estate and he looked at his children and they weren't turning out too good, he would adopt a son. And that son was picked, chosen, and developed to be the one who would inherit the estate when the old man died. That son became more important in many ways than his biological children. Now, if a Roman father had a son who grew up to be reliable and, 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 and responsible and, 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 you know, reasonable, then he was double blessed. But if he looked in there and he goes, boy, that, mm-mm. <laughs> Uh, I don't think that boy's got it. <laughs> he would look for another young man who was orphaned. And 
he would adopt him. And man, doesn't that change that verse? Wow! In fact, the one adopted had a unique and special status and privilege. Just, just think about how amazing your journey with Jesus has been. You used to be a slave to sin. Now you're a son of the king. You were once estranged from God, and now you're a daughter of God. We are, we are now family, and we are deliberately chosen, deliberately, listen to me now, cherished by our Father. Galatians 4 and verse 6, Because you are sons, God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. What a beautiful and intimate relationship. Jesus brought that on, by the way. The Jews would call God their father, no problem. He was the, you know, the head of everything, the, 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 the head of the family, the, the, the one on top, the father in heaven. They, but they would never call him Abba. Abba is like Papa. It's like Daddy. You ever heard that phrase, who's your daddy? Hey, church, who's your daddy? Uh, that was a terrible way to answer that question. You guys did not, you weren't ready for that, were you? Still, five years stand up and preaching like this, and they still don't know how to answer a question. Church, who's your daddy? That's right. God is. And who's God? Owns everything, is everywhere. Praise the Lord. Amen. Your daddy owns everything. And that's a fact. Your daddy is your Abba, your Papa. He's the warrior king. We don't talk much about this in the New Testament era. It's all over the Old Testament. I think it's a fantastic phrase right now. God is not only my shepherd, not only king of kings, he's a warrior king. Oh, I like that right now. Doesn't that just ring right now? You know what? If I ask you who your daddy is and you say God is, boy, that's blessed assurance, isn't it? I know it because the Spirit confirms that, affirms that deep within my spirit that I am, I am a child of him. Now, in verse 17, it mentions the idea of inheritance. It does seem a little strange to us in America in the 21st century, the idea of being God's heirs. I mean, how much do we think about inheritance spiritually, theologically? I would venture to say for probably many of us who are in the room or watching this online, for many of us, we inherited a fairly modest estate from our parents. Some of us didn't, but I would say for the bulk of us, we, when our, when our uh, let me put it this way, when you die and your will is read, I, I imagine for many of you, there's not going to be a, a very large amount that your kids are going to end up with. So inheritance for us, it's not as nearly as vital and important as it was in the first century, or even today now, even in other nations. It's very, very critical, the idea of what you're inheriting from your parents when they pass on. And it kind of, it's a little bit confusing. We're, we're uh, heirs with Christ, but it's not like God's going to die one day and we get all his stuff, right? That, that doesn't make sense. Because God lives forever. So what's he talking about? Well, the value is determined by the one who's offering it. Listen to this. The inheritance of the Christian is from the creator, sustainer, and owner of the world, and your inheritance is based upon his wealth. Ooh, that just got good, huh? That just got good. One day, everything on earth will perish and disappear. The whole planet is defiled and corrupted, according to Romans 8. We'll see in a little while. But by great and glorious, marvelous contrast, one day every believer will, listen to this, 
obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven. 1 Peter 1, 4. One day, our earthly life will be over, and one day, we will be prepared to live in an eternal state with God in a body that's awesome, and will not be fatigued, and it won't be corrupted, and it won't be sick, and it won't be old, and it won't be crippled, and it won't be weak. It will be a glorified, Im immortal, spiritual, heavenly body. And God is going to give us an inheritance once we get there. And I can't help but think that the thing that I look for most is not some mansion. But I'm going to be able to see him, him, himself. Right now, we walk by faith. Right now, I don't know how tall Jesus is. Do you? Does anybody know what Jesus' waist size is? I don't. Do you know how curly his hair is? I don't know. Do you know, uh, how, do you know how big his nose is? I don't know. I've never seen him with my eyes. I've never seen Christ with my eyes. I love him more than my wife and my kids, and yet I've never seen him with my eyes. But when I get there, yeah, glitter and gold and sparkly and beautiful and angels and worship and singing and reunions and all the people are there already and all that stuff's going to be fantastic. But I'm telling you what, the thing's going to get my pump going is it him in the middle of the city sitting on a throne and I get to see him with my own eyes finally after all this time, all this struggle, all this frustration. That will be done. And I'll be able to see him, see him himself. Oh, man, we need to talk more about that, I think. Don't you? I found a really cool psalm. It says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth I desire besides you. Wow. See, he, David wanted to be with God. Psalm 73, 25. This sounds familiar. Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. That's a loud voice, right? And he will dwell with them and they will be his people and listen to me now and God himself will be with them as their God. Jesus said to his apostles, it's good that I'm leaving, John 14. It's good that I'm not staying here. And they didn't get it. What? And he had to explain to them, I'm going and I'm going to prepare a place. Don't get hung up on the place preparation. The next phrase is what, I don't know why it doesn't get the, it needs to be highlighted, and underlined, it needs to have an arrow pointed to it, it needs to have a, that you may be with me. That's heaven. That's heaven. That you may be with me. Hope. As I started out in this series weeks ago, hope is the greatest word for us right now. Hope is what it's all about. Hope, yes, that the pestilence will pass. Hope that the normal that we miss so badly will return. Hope that all these funerals for people dying of COVID will be gone. Hope for us that, that goes beyond medical security and goes beyond economic stability. Hope that one day, one day, we will hear that trumpet. And that trumpet belongs to God. And there's an angel who's going to blow that thing, and that's going to announce Jesus is coming right now. That's hope, that hope that we'll be raised and given uh, these perfect glorified bodies, that hope that one day we'll, we'll behold sights that can't even be described right now. They're beyond description. And one day we will behold him, and he will be with us, and he will reward us for all that suffering and all that endurance that we've gone through because we've honored Christ in a world that's hostile to his name.
1 John chapter 3, when I see what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. There it is again. I'm a child of God, so he said so. The reason why the world does not know us is it did not know him. Verse 2, beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Can't you wait? And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself because he is pure. And I need to tell you something, family. My life is more pure because of Romans 6, 7, and 8 than it was a year ago. John McCraney's life. My confession in prayer time has shortened because of the power of the word of truth in all of this. But the fact that I know that I'm going to be there and I'm going to see him purifies me even more. Hope, isn't that a good word? Feel like singing it? I didn't hear your answer. Stand up then, let's sing. Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood, and all around my soul gives way. Then is my all, my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Good job, church. Please be seated. The song will prepare our mind for the Lord's Supper. If you don't have the, uh, the communion, uh, it's out there in the hall or in the foyer. You can bring it in at this time. We saw thee not. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet beheld thy cottage home in that despised Nazareth. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plain, Thou Son of God, but we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plain, thou Son of God. 
We saw thee not when lifted high amid that wild and savage crew, nor heard we that imploring cry, forgive they know not what they do, but we believe the deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun. But we believe the deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun. We gaze not in the open tomb where once thy may gold body lay, nor saw thee in that upper room, nor met thee on the open way. But we believe that angel said, why seek the living with the dead? But we believe that angel said, why seek the living with the dead? We walk not with the chosen few who saw thee from the earth ascend, who raised to have their wandering view, then low to earth all prostrate bend. But we believe that human eyes beheld that journey to the sky. But we believe that human eyes beheld that journey to the skies. Good morning, family. Um, John, that was fantastic. I enjoyed that. And you've got to tell this guy here, that was, we've got to let him know how really good he is. That was excellent, John. Thank you for that. Today, this do in remembrance of me. Christ has commanded us to celebrate the Lord's Supper. You know, we know when, on the uh, first occasion it happened, he broke the bread, the fruit of the vine, and he asked them to do this. So for the moment, let's, let's pray for the bread. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that Christ would sacrifice his body, that one day we could be with you, that we could be saved. Lord, we know that he went through a, much suffering and pain and anguish and ultimately for all our benefits so one day we can be with him. We pray for the bread in Jesus' holy name. Yeah, after Jesus had passed around the bread, he got the fruit of the vine and, and passed it to the disciples and told them, this is my blood. The blood that he shed that would wash away our sins again so that we can benefit and be with him in Christ. If we follow the scripture and do what's asked of God, that's our, it's in the Bible, We'll one day see him. Simple. We just have to do what he asks. Let's pray for the uh, fruit of the vine. Dear Lord, again, we th so thank you for that Jesus would shed his blood. This blood would wash away our sins and give us a, a chance to be with you in heaven. 
Lord, we're so thankful that he did this and that we're able through his actions to see you one day again if we follow your word. We pray for this in Jesus' holy name.